Thundercats. Sword in a Hole. In the control room at the cat's lair, Panthro listened intently to the voice that crackled out of the loudspeaker. Mayday! 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 This is the space liner Vertus. Space liner Vertus. Mayday! Mayday! Immediately, the Thundercat emergency rescue procedures were set in motion. Lionel, Chitara, and Snarf manned their space vessel, the Feliner, and prepared for launch. While Panthro tried to gather more information about the plight of the stricken spaceship. What is your position, Vertus? Six light years past Orion, in the Sea of Stars. The voice faded away and was drowned by electronic interference. Panthro spoke urgently into his microphone. I can't hear you, Vertus. Give me a damage control report. Floundering. A galactic wind shear took out our port control vane. We're taking on nitrous gas. Pumps can't keep up. Hurry, before it's too late. Panthro flipped a switch. Control the feliner. Course computed and implemented. Prepare for takeoff. Chitara punched in some last-minute corrections to the flight plan, and soon the feliner's engines began to howl. Lionel pulled back the red throttle lever, and the spaceship seared out of its hangar in the paw of the cat's lair and scorched a path through the gray morning, streaking up into the sky. As it passed over the pyramid of Mumra, the sky darkened, and lightning flashed between the obelisks and the tip of the pyramid. Inside the pyramid, Mumra shuffled from his sarcophagus and looked up towards the receding sound of the speeding feliner. His laugh was an evil cackle. <laughs> I knew those miserable thundercats would never be able to resist an SOS from outer space, but all they're heading for is a rendezvous with extinction, and I will be rid of the Sword of Omens and the wretched Eye of Thundera forever! Unaware that they were being lured into a trap, the Thundercats sped on towards the Sea of Stars. As they approached it, the feliner began to pitch and yaw. Lionel called out a warning. Stand by for some bad weather! Snarf checked his safety harness. Hmm, what causes the turbulence here? Galactic wind shear, answered Chitara, concentrating on the controls. This is a dangerous area! Hmm, then why would that space liner try to cross it? Probably blown off course, Snarf, suggested Lionel. He broke off as he noticed a light flashing on the console. We're getting a course correction, 649er. Chitara checked it out. Couldn't be worse. That ship is right on the edge of a black hole. If you fall in, you vanish. Kapoof. Suddenly, Lionel caught sight of the stricken ship ahead of them. They were right on target, and soon the great speed of the feliner brought it alongside, and Lionel hailed the vessel. Hello? The Vertus. Permission to come aboard. Can you hear me, Vertus? This is the Thundercats Feliner Rescue, responding to a Mayday signal. There was no reply, so Lionel and Snarf decided to go aboard anyway. The enormous size of the apparently abandoned Vertus dwarfed the Feliner, and the turbulence made the transfer from one ship to another a risky operation. First Lionel, and then Snarf, jumped from the swaying Feliner to the equally unstable Vertus. But as Snarf made the jump, he missed, and Lionel had to grab him by the tail and haul him aboard the pitching gangway. Snarf protested. Ah, oh, that's Snarf's. Lionel pointed down into space below them. Sorry, but I thought you'd prefer that to dropping down there. Snarf looked down and caught his first sight of the awesome black hole. A churning mass of volatile clouds marked its edge as it constantly moved in on itself, appearing to swallow up the very sky. Ah, it looks so close. Probably a dozen light years away, corrected Lionel. But it does give that impression. Come on, we have work to do. He spoke into the intercom. Entering the liner, Chitara. They searched the luxurious passenger accommodation, but found no sign of any living thing. Then they turned their attention to the crew's quarters. They went from room to room, finding no one, but as they entered the dining room, they stopped dead. The table was set, with food on the plates and steaming coffee in the cups. They each picked up a cup of coffee. Lionel sniffed his cautiously. Well, it's hot, but it doesn't smell right. 
and as he spoke, the room appeared to spin, and Lionel fell unconscious to the floor. Chitara, keeping vigil in the Thundercat rescue vessel, tried to get in contact with Lionel, but was unable to raise him. She anxiously scanned her monitor screens and saw a great claw extended from the side of the Vertus, which was about to grab the feliner. She stabbed a button on the console, and a red-hot rocket blast melted the claw before it could close. Immediately, other arresting devices were projected from the Vertus to try and trap the feliner, but Chitara used full throttle and, with skillful aerobatics, managed to avoid them all and escaped into deep space. Back aboard the Vertus, Lionel and Snarf regained consciousness to find themselves manacled and chained, prisoners of a space captain named Shiner. Snarf was puzzled. <coughs> but what do you want from us? Sadly, Lionel answered him. He has what he wants. From behind his back, Captain Shiner produced the Sword of Omens. The hilt and eye itself were tightly wrapped with black tape. Snarf was still puzzled. The sword of omens, snarf, snarf. Why? This time, Shiner gave him the answer. I am a mercenary. I did it for the money. A cackling voice came out of the air. <laughs> and I paid the money. <laughs> they stared as the hideous form of Mumra materialized and took the sword of omens from Captain Shiner. Without your wretched sword, Thundercat, you are nothing. Snarf stepped forward, but was restrained by a guard. He glared at Mumra. <coughs> You're wasting your time. <coughs> the sword of omens does not work for evil. I may not be able to use it, you miserable creature, but I can certainly destroy it. Lionel leaped forward. No. The chains and the guard held him back, and Mumra led them all to an airlock in the bowels of the ship. It was opened to reveal the black hole swirling ominously below them. Mumra raised the sword above his head. Hear me, Anquat, Anubis, Apophis! I offer up the Eye of Thundera! I consign to the deep this defender of the right, the just and the weak! No! Mumra hurled the sword like a javelin down into the black hole, which it entered and disappeared. Before he left the ship, Mumra made sure that Lionel and Snarf were taken care of. They were sent down to the reactor room and set to work on the boron control rods. Mumra cackled with evil glee. <laughs> Fine! A good dose of radioactivity will cool them down! Snarf turned anxiously to Lionel. We won't last 24 hours down here! Lionel looked grim. I'm afraid that's the idea. Chitara returned to Third Earth and picked up Panthro. She flew back with him to the Sea of Stars and inverted the feliner over the Vertus. Panthro dropped down onto the hull of the liner, opened an emergency hatch, and climbed inside. As he closed it, he heard the voice of Captain Shiner over the ship's intercom. This is your Captain. We are now underway. I'd like to welcome two new engine room members. A lion and a fuzzy dog. <laughs> Panthro smiled with satisfaction. That little joke will cost you, clown. Now I know where they are. He made his way to the reactor room and soon overpowered the guard and released Lionel and Snarf from their radioactive prison. He was shocked to learn that Mumra had taken the Sword of Omens, but Lionel told him that things were even worse. Mumra threw the sword into the black hole. It's gone for good. Panthro looked grim. How many of these raiders are we up against? Maybe a dozen. First, we shut the engine down. Then we deal with them. It did not take long for the three Thundercats to neutralize the crew, and soon Captain Shiner found himself at the helm of his ship under the direction of Panthro. Stay on this course, Captain. You are directing me back to the black hole? Not back to it. Into it. You're mad. We'll disappear forever. Even Lionel looked surprised, but Panthro was quite serious. I have a theory about that. The turbulence increased in intensity as they approached the black hole, and as they went into it, Shiner feared that the ship would break up. But Panthro made him keep on course. Suddenly, 
all was quiet and the turbulence ceased. They came out of utter darkness into light. Ahead of them were the hulks of derelict spaceships and other space junk. Panthro gazed at the wreckage. It looks like an astral scrapyard. Shiner nodded thoughtfully. The legendary sea of lost spaceships. But what caused it? asked Lion-O. Panthro pointed ahead. I suspect some gigantic force field. Look there. They saw what seemed to be a super power station with towers rising five miles high, and as they gazed at it, a metallic voice boomed through the communication speakers. Now hear this. Stand by to take our tow beam by the orders of Neptune. Neptune? queried Lion-O. The Navy Engineers Power Tower under nuclear energy. Neptune. A thick beam of light emanating from the towers locked onto the Vertus, and the ship was towed by invisible forces along the beam until it reached the gigantic power station. They were commanded to enter and found themselves propelled along glass tubes by a rush of air to a vast computer at the control center. There was no need for guards. There was no way that they could escape. Captain Shiner immediately asserted himself. Sir, I demand to see your human control. The voice of Neptune answered them. I am in control here. lion realized the implication. You mean there is no human force in control here? Fortunately not, or this plant would have broken down eons ago. lion looked into the banks of flashing lights. But what is the purpose of this huge power station? Why did you create a black hole? To clear the spaceways of derelicts burned out satellites and other dangerous space hazards, according to the Clean Air Act. Panthro was impressed by the architecture. Who built these towers? Venusian Public Works. Venus has been a burned-out planet for a thousand years, lion whispered to Panthro. There was no chance, then, that they would be able to deal with anyone other than this computer. Panthro addressed it again. Neptune, we are here to retrieve a lost sword. May we proceed with the search? No. All property entering the station is claimed by salvage right. And that was not all. The computer went on to inform them that there was no way home and that they must spend the rest of their lives in the station. They were conveyed along the glass tubes to a bare room furnished with steel bunks and a central table which was to be their home from now on. Panthro was thoughtful. If I could get into the central power station, I think I could rig it to let us escape. We were pulled here by a positive magnetic force. If I reverse that force, it would push us out. Snarf noticed a snag. Ah, all very well, Panthro, but we're stuck in here, and the walls are solid titanium. All seemed lost. But at that moment, Jaga, the mystic one of the Thundercats, materialized before lion -O. The Eye of Thundera is with you, lion -O, the source of the Thundercat's power. But I cannot summon it, Jaga. Shiner has sealed the Eye. It sleeps, Jaga, and I cannot awaken it. Sealed or not, the Eye never sleeps, lion -O. Jaga faded away, and lion -O thought for a moment. Then he came to a decision, raised one clenched fist high, and called aloud, Thunder! Thunder! Thundercats! Ho! Amidst a collection of space junk, the sword began to quiver, and light began to glow beneath the black tape that bound it. Back in the bare room, lion stretched out his hand. Sword of omens! Come to my hand! The room was bathed in a red glow, and the sword materialized through the titanium walls and flew directly to lion -O's outstretched hand. Okay, Panthro, let's go. lion -O pointed the sword at the door, and a laser beam flashed from the tip and cut a way through it. Panthro made for the transformer room to reverse the power supply, while the other Thundercats hurried back to the Vertus with Captain Shiner. He soon had the spaceship powered up and ready for takeoff. Anxiously, they waited for Panthro to join them, which he did, just as the magnetic field of the power station reversed and sent the Vertus and all the other space junk hurtling out of the black hole and into normal space. Desperately, Shiner maneuvered his ship through a sea of dangerous flying objects until, without warning, a huge wrecked rocket loomed up ahead. It slammed into the Vertus, tearing off the port wing of the bridge. Shiner ordered the Thundercats to abandon ship, and Panthro called out to him as they did so. 
Come on, Shiner. You don't have to go down with the ship. Oh, yes, I do. The wreck of the Vertus drifted away, leaving the Thundercats tethered together by a lifeline in the silence of deep space. Snarf saw something. Ah, lion -O, there's a star moving towards us at a good clip. Couldn't be a star, Snarf. Panthro agreed. lion -O's right. It's traveling too fast to be a star. But not too fast to be the Thee-Liner. In a moment, Chitara had collected them, and they were on their way back to Third Earth. lion -O looked back into space. I'm sorry Captain Shiner went down with the ship. He was on the wrong side, but he was a brave man. Panthro nodded. Don't be too sure he didn't survive. He was a remarkable space pilot. Far away in space, the battered wreck of the Vertus cruised painfully along, driven by space winds caught in a makeshift sail. lion -O turned back to Panthro. You never know with a man like Shiner. Thundercats. Secret of the Ice King. The distant peaks of Third Earth shook as an erupting volcano spewed out molten lava and sent it cascading down the mountain's sloping flanks. Something glittering in the solidifying lava caught the eye of a soaring pterodactyl. The monstrous flying reptile dived down and grabbed the sparkling gemstone in its beak and flew on towards Hook Mountain. As it passed over the mountain's great crest of overhanging snow and ice, it was attacked by a second pterodactyl. It opened its fearsome beak to defend itself, and the gemstone fell towards the earth and landed in the snowfields of Hook Mountain. The dazzling rays of the blazing sun were refracted by the stone, and a beam flashed out towards a great ice wall. The ice began to melt, and gradually a figure was revealed that had been frozen solid within. As the ice continued to melt, the figure began to stir. Twelve feet tall, with beard and hair of ice, and long icicle fingers, he was an awesome sight. For a moment he stood bewildered, and then gazed with sad eyes towards the castle of the Snow Knight, which glimmered in the middle distance. He seemed to recognize it, and with a low moan began to move towards it. When he reached the castle, the drawbridge was up. With a roar, he blew out a great cloud of ice fog, which solidified to form a bridge, which arched from where he stood up to the parapet of the castle. He mounted the bridge and made his way heavily along it. The thud of his mighty footfalls made the castle shake and aroused its owner. He climbed to the parapet of his castle and peered over it. Who dares shake the castle of Snow Knight? He saw the ice giant making his way towards him over the solid ice fog bridge. Glittering glaciers, the Ice King, he is free of his thousand years sleep, but how? He called for Snow Meow to help him the great furry snowcat charged out to his aid. Eyes flashing, it reared up, claws raking the air. Snow Knight rolled a large snow boulder to where a sling was hung between two upjutting parapet stones. He loaded the boulder into the sling and called to Snow Meow. That bridge is giving the Ice King an easy way in. Destroy it, Snow Meow! Snow Meow eagerly grabbed the sling between his teeth, and with his big feet clawing and scratching on the slippery stones of the ice-covered parapet, drew back the sling to its fullest extent. The Ice King was halfway across the bridge when Snow Meow released the sling. The device sent the snow missile hurtling through the air to land just in front of the intruder. The bridge cracked and collapsed, and the Ice King fell into the frozen moat below. He was unhurt but very angry. The Snow Knight lowered the drawbridge and mounted Snow Meow. 
the ancient warning said the Ice King must never gain entry. Charge, Snow Meow! Crouching behind his ice shield, the Snow Knight leveled his ice lance and hurtled towards the Ice King. But the Ice King stretched out his hand, and ice projectiles zipped from his icicle fingers towards his adversary, shattering his lance. Then he breathed out a great breath of ice fog, which enveloped the Snow Knight. Ice! Encasing me! Your thick fur, Snow Meow, protects thee! Soon the Snow Knight was totally encased in ice. He slid off the back of Snow Meow and landed upright, a frozen statue. Before his face was completely locked in ice, he managed one last message to his faithful snow cat. Snow Meow, fetch help, fetch the thunder cats at once. Snow Meow nodded, and with one final pitying look back at his master, galloped off across the snowfields. The Ice King stomped past the frozen statue of the Snow Knight and over the drawbridge into the castle. Lion-O was alone in the control room at the cat's lair when he noticed a blip on the scanner. Snow Meow, what in Thundera brings my old snow cat friend here from Hook Mountain, alone? When he was let into the cat's lair, Snow Meow reared up and put his paws on lion -O's shoulders. He licked his face and mewed and moaned. lion -O stood his ground with difficulty. Snow Meow, you old roughneck. Easy, boy. I love you, too. No, something's wrong. You're trying to tell me something. Snow Knight, is he in trouble? Snow Meow nodded vigorously and gestured with one great paw. I understand, Snow Meow. Snow Knight needs help. Wait here. Soon, lion -O was back with the Sword of Omens, and he rode Snow Meow out of the cat's lair. To Hook Mountain, Snow Meow, fast as you can! When they reached Hook Mountain, lion -O shielded his eyes from the glare of the snow and looked towards the castle. There's an ice giant bombarding the castle. He's knocking it down stone by stone, and Snow Knight's turned into a helpless ice statue. He's the Thundercat's friend, and we've sworn to help each other by the sacred code of Thundera. Forward, Snow Meow! Snow Meow galloped onward to the castle, and lion -O gestured with his sword towards the Ice King on the parapet above him. You there, giant! Stop this destruction and free Snow Knight! I, lion -O, Lord of the Thundercats, command it! The Ice King replied with a shower of ice projectiles from his fingers, which lion -O warded off with his whirling sword. The Ice King gave a roar, and a great cloud of ice fog undulated down upon lion -O and Snow Meow. Snow Meow reared and tried to turn and run. lion -O reassured him. This ice giant has a limited vocabulary, but I understand your fear, Snow Meow. His breath is dangerous. Sword of Omens, give me heat! lion -O's sword glowed, and radiant heat waves spread out and met the approaching ice fog and destroyed it. The Ice King jumped up and down on the parapet with rage. Then he made a gesture towards a great mass of snow and ice, which clung to the upper walls of the castle just above lion -O. The snow mass began to slide, but with a force field from his sword, lion -O halted the falling snow and then reversed it so that it returned to strike the Ice King himself. Surprised and angry, the giant staggered back and then created a twisting wave of sheer cold from his fingertips, which whirled like a corkscrew and sucked up a great hill of snow into a spinning funnel which bore down upon Snow Meow and lion -O. A snow tornado! Run, Snow Meow! Run! The Ice King laughed with glee as the snow tornado caught up with them, sucked them up into its funnel, and carried them whirling away across the snowfields of Hook Mountain. Inside the white, twisting whirlwind, strange hand-like forms of ice grabbed at lion -O's sword and pulled it from his grasp. It fell to the ground and was buried in a snowbank far below. The tornado danced on, over the snow, and ejected Snow Meow like a spinning top. When he stopped spinning, he looked after the tornado and saw lion -O ejected alongside the frozen snow knight. lion -O was encased in ice and formed an ice statue, too. Snow Meow bounded up and looked at them with dismay. Then he raced off and dug in the snowbank until he found the Sword of Omens. He came up with it in his mouth and saw that the snow tornado had dislodged the crest of Hook Mountain and produced an enormous avalanche of snow and ice, which swept over him and carried on like an irresistible white tide until the whole plain of fertility was covered in snow. And still the ice cap continued to spread, more slowly now, as it reached and began to surround the cat's lair. The Ice King smiled and continued to demolish the castle while lion -O stared out from his icy prison. 
his eyes filled with helpless alarm. The Thundercats, with the exception of Lionel, had been out on an expedition in the Thunder Tank and were returning to the lair. Panthro was the first to notice something unusual. Strange. Looks like a snowfield ahead. But that's impossible at this time of year, rejoined Tigra. Chitara was alert immediately. You don't need my intuition to know that something's very wrong. An approaching object attracted their attention. Too small to identify at first, at last they made out the figure of Snow Meow. He galloped up to the thunder tank with the sword of omens still in his mouth. Panthro asked for the sword, but Snow Meow would not relinquish it. Instead, he reared up, took a few steps away, and then came back again. Chitara watched him. He's trying to tell us something. He wants us to follow him, I think, said Tigra. Panthro hesitated no longer. Okay, Snow Meow, we'll follow. Go, go. Snow Meow bounded off, closely followed by the Thundercats in their thunder tank. They came to the cat's lair, half buried in snow, but Snow Meow did not want to stop. Tigra was afraid that Lionel might be inside and in trouble, so Chitara went in to check, while the others continued to follow Snow Meow. Chitara could easily catch up with them later. Everywhere was blanketed with snow. Tigra gazed solemnly over the wintry scene. Hard to believe it. This ice cap is covering almost everything within miles. But what caused it? Panthro pointed ahead. Look, there's part of the answer. The whole top of Hook Mountain has been torn off. They arrived at the castle of the Snow Knight just as Chitara caught up with them. She had found no sign of Lionel at the lair, but she knew why when she came upon him, frozen in ice, beside the similarly suffering Snow Knight. The Ice King loomed above them on the demolished walls of the castle. Telling Chitara to stay with Lionel, Panthro drove the tank on, directing the flamethrower at the Ice King. He countered with a frigid wave from his fingers, which built up a column of ice beneath the thunder tank, making it rise higher and higher in the air so that it was unable to move forward, and the flamethrower missed its target. Quickly, Panthro sent flames issuing from below and melted the column of ice until the thunder tank sank gently back to ground level and continued on its way forward. Undismayed, the Ice King breathed out a great cloud of ice fog which completely shrouded the thunder tank. Snarf was unimpressed. Meow, fog! That stuff can't hurt old thunder tank! Can it? But Chitara could see the danger, and she yelled into her communicator. Button up! You're icing badly! Close your vents for submerged running! Desperately, Tigra and Panthro wrestled with the vent controls. They were too late. The controls were frozen, and nothing could stop the ice fog from seeping into the cabin, and soon the Thundercats were frozen at their stations like Lionel, unable to move. The Ice King moved away with a laugh to continue with his destruction of the castle. Chitara peered through the tank windows at the unfortunate Thundercats. Frozen, just like Lionel. Snow Meow, the sword... Give it to me now! Snow Meow gave her the sword, and she walked over to the frozen lion -o. I hope this works! She banged on the ground with her staff. The surface broke like ice into long cracks. Again she struck the ground with her staff, and the ice on lion -o began to crack, until one hand came free. She put the sword into it and closed his fingers over the hilt. The sword seemed to radiate energy as lion -o came to life. His muscles bulged, the ice cracked. The sword glowed with heat, and Lionel was completely free. He turned to his rescuers. Chitara, Snow Meow, what's going on? Panthro, Tigra, and Snarf, they're frozen in the tank. Hurry! Lionel lifted up the sword, and it grew in his hand as he began to chant, Thunder, 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 thundercats, ho! He pointed the sword at the tank, and an energy beam streamed from its tip and melted the ice. Then he turned it on the snow knight, and soon he too was free. Everybody okay? inquired Lionel anxiously. Snarf answered for them all. Ah, yes, thank you, Lionel. Let's get back to the lair and a nice warm fire. First, we've got him to deal with. <coughs> Lionel pointed to the ice king, who was digging in the ice and taking no notice of them for the moment. Snow knight, this ice king, what do you know of him? Nothing, Lionel, but he seems to be searching for something, something very important to him. Have you seen him before? No, but legend speaks of him having perished a thousand years ago. Tigra interrupted them. 
Look, he's uncovered something. In the ruins of the castle, the Ice King had discovered a door of bluish metal. He forced it open and went through it. Using the Sword of Omens, Lionel was able to see what was going on inside. A blue-skinned dragon, breathing red steam, lunged at the Ice King as he approached, leaving its nest unguarded. In the nest was a single golden egg, with what appeared to be a small window in it, and it was the egg that the Ice King wanted. But the red steam of the dragon was more than a match for the ice fog of the Ice King. Lionel sensed that the Ice King was not entirely evil. He called out to him, "A truce, Ice King! Peace, and we will help you get that egg." The Ice King nodded in grateful acceptance of the Thundercat's aid. Lionel distracted the dragon while Chitara dashed past in a blur of speed to get the egg. The Thundercats tossed it from one to another, and the Ice King leaped upon the dragon's back and wrestled with it in a titanic battle. Locked in a struggling embrace, they fell into a deep crevice. The ground shook, and red steam and white ice fog rose in billowing clouds. At last, all was still. And the exhausted Ice King pulled himself up out of the crevice. He gestured weakly at the egg, his eyes full of yearning. They gave it to him. He took it gently and peered into the window in its side. For a few moments, he remained motionless, staring at a miniature world inside the egg. A beautiful golden-haired ice princess stood in front of a replica of the castle. At last, he took the egg from his eye. And with a smile of complete happiness, collapsed and melted away, until nothing was left of him but a slight ridge in the snow. Lionel picked up the egg. I wonder why he was so desperate to get this. He peered into the little window and then passed it to the others. Inside the egg, they saw what was happening in the miniature world. The beautiful golden-haired ice princess stood clad in a snow-white cloak. But beside her now stood a handsome young ice prince, as they must have stood a thousand years ago. Panthro smiled. He wasn't such a bad guy after all. The Snow Knight looked thoughtful. Hmm, part of the old legend of Snow Mountain. I remember now. A curse trapped the ice princess in the egg, and he couldn't find her. Snarf peered again into the egg. You guys trying to tell me that that old ice king and this young handsome prince here were the same person? Lionel nodded. There's no other explanation, is there? And as they all looked at the miniature scene within the egg, snow began to fall. <laughs>